Good morning, Sarah. Good morning, Louise. How are you today? I'm good. And here we are in season two. I can't we believe it. it. Woo! I know. We need some champagne in we our do. closets. Non-alcoholic <laughs> champagne for me. Right. <laughs> That's exactly true. I'll do I'll join you in that. Um, yes. So we are on to Journey of the Adopted Self, a quest for wholeness by Betty Jean Lifton. And you know, we we, as we say, don't cheat. We can just go chapter to chapter on our podcast. And this blew me away last night, actually. Me too. It, I didn't think I wanted to move on from Nancy, you know, like I'm cheating on Nancy. No, I'm like, wow. I know. And I think Nancy was inspired by her. Wasn't she? I think she was. And I think they became quite good friends, which we're talking about of, Nancy Verrier for yes. anybody who's just, uh, who and wrote I, the primal. I think that became a, I think that became a neat story between them, their friendship, as I remember anyway, so we're on chapter one. It's called Betwixt and Between, which I loved. I'm just going to read the little quote at the beginning because we'll all see where it came from. Then I shan't be exactly human, Peter asked. No, what shall I be? You'll be betwixt and between, Solomon said. And certainly he was a wise old fellow, for that is exactly how it turned out. And that's from James Berry, Peter Pan in Kensington Gardens. So right away, I was like, oh, here we go, because I loved Peter Pan as a kid. Mm-hmm identifying with it but I think starting out I really like number one that she's an adoptee yes I do too and because she really I felt like oh she is seeing into our souls because she's one of us yes and it is it is a big switch in that way and I also she didn't come to this like from a ch- young age going oh I'm adopted I've got to figure it out it's like you and I mm-hmm. she came to this later and I yes. thought I really related to her like right away. I was taken in by this. And, and, you know, when like comparing it to Peter Pan, uh, denied the right to see their real birth certificates in the name of those who brought them into the world. They can't be sure they ever had a real birthday. They can never grow up because they are always referred to as an adopted child. Is that crazy? I know. And she, she said in this Also, I had come from somewhere else, a place shrouded in mystery, a place that like myself was betwixt in between. Mm -hmm. I really, I I thought it was so talented how she pulled in Peter Pan and this whole analogy, because it really was like, wow, was, you know, the writer of Peter Pan adopted? (laughs) I feel like we need to look it up. (laughs) I know. And and there's just, um, she's a great writer too. I mean, she's she's, a great writer. She she released books prior to this. So, I mean, she's, she's really a a good writer. Yeah. Here's, here's the one part at the very beginning on page four that I wanted to start with, because I thought you and I would really dig into this. She, she, um, was told by her mother, she was adopted, but not to tell around age seven, not Mm -hmm. to tell the father, her adopted father, because it would break his heart if he knew she was adopted. No, he knew she was adopted, but if he knew that she she knew, knew. yes, yes. (laughs) Like he wanted it, you know, he didn't ever want her to know it's just my little girl. Okay. That's all fine and good. But so she starts off in this way. I learned that secrecy and adoption were inextricably mixed as a witch's brew by becoming a keeper of the secret. I was to collaborate in the family conspiracy of silence. And I didn't know that our little family family secret was connected to the big secret in the closed adoption system. Right. Just as our little conspiracy was connected to the larger social conspiracy around adoption. I was like, okay, that's really interesting. Because then she gets into, obviously, the intricacies of that. And how, you know, also that comparing it to the secrets like around alcoholic families and divorce and incest and all the other things that family members are prone to hide from their neighbors and from one another, you know, just Makes yes. me think of that movie, Two Secrets and Lies from a long time oh ago. Remember that? I love that movie. Yes. Um, I have to revisit that now. Yes, I am too. It just made me think of that. Uh, yeah. So, and then here, here's something mm-hmm. that I completely identified with and had never really had the kind of words for this, but she said she hadn't, she had no idea of all the secrecy as a child. So having repressed her real feelings, here's her words, having repressed, repressed my real feelings, I was not consciously aware of my pain. And as a consequence, I was not consciously aware of myself, Mm. except as someone unreal pretending to be real. 
I did things that my human friends did, even looked real in my high school and college graduation pictures and in the photographs taken at my wedding. Perhaps I might never have been in touch with my real feelings if shortly after my return. Anyway, she gets into a a whole story, but that's, I totally relate to that. (laughs) Like. But this, this, it's funny you said that because this jarred open some memories for me as well. You know, thinking back, oh, I look, you know, and if my high school friends were listening, they'd say, oh, she looked normal in high school and felt normal in middle school. I did not. I was very lonely, socially isolated. And I went to this camp in the summers and I had so many dark things I would hide from myself and my personality during that time, not knowing I was going through all of these things. Who am I? I was this to like jarred it open that I felt like I was always putting on like, oh, you know, I'll show up for this and I'm a good kid and I'm smiling and I'd look at other people like, do they know who they are? Like in a really weird way, a deeper way. And I felt the same as you, like, hello, she just nailed it on the head, right? Yeah. So, you know, I think it's, it's really only been since we've done this podcast and coming out of the fog for myself. I mean, I would, I've said this before, I would pay lip service to my adoption having affected me, but I didn't really connect it. I, and still sometimes I conflate, like, was it my adoption or was it the subsequent abandonments by my adoptive parents, uh, physically, emotionally, all that stuff. It's all intertwined. Um, but the original heal the original wound, you know, it is. And the thing that she gets into in another place uh, she talked about well, this part hit me about her, um, adopted parents. They were, uh, is this part of it? She was feeling guilty because she was talking about her trauma. She gets older and her parents have deceased her adopted parents and she loved them. She was in a good relationship with them, but she had guilt still writing this book, Yes, talking about it. And that's where I'm more at, you know, like I, I miss my parents every day and I love them, but I feel guilty, but I do have these feelings and I, and I did feel different and I did wonder who I was. And I think it felt really nice that like someone who could write a book on it and be famous for it and like be the voice, what did they call her? The Bible of like for adopted children also had those feelings like having guilt. And I just remember she said she didn't want to search because she'd hurt somebody. And you and I've talked so much about it. And I think they're, they're, I think adoptive parents because of their own grief and loss, uh, then they do put that on their children. Like, you know, you're my baby, you're my child, you're my daughter. And I mean, frankly, that's just not true. They were someone else's baby that you took into your life and, you know, provided a life for good or bad, happy or sad, but that is the truth. It is Uh, the truth. But we are are made to, you know, purposefully or not to have a guilt if we want to know who we are. It's just bizarre. It is bizarre. bizarre. And it's the thing that she really tackles in this, I don't know, because we haven't read the whole book is closed adoptions, what you and I went through. Mm -hmm. So we do know adoption. There's many types of adoption, different adoptions. Adoption has changed, but the closed adoptions you and I went through, I think it was almost like told to parents, you know, that's your family. Now it's don't bring up the other thing. Yes. Yes. It and was. I think, I think so too, because how she was even saying it, her parents said what my parents would say, you know, it, there was no room to ask. It would be really uncomfortable. If I asked, I remember being little and saying things like, well, what did my mom look like? And I'd use the word mom, you know, you're little. So what did my mom look like? And everyone would shut that down pretty quick. Mm -hmm. You know, she was this good person and move on. And I'll never forget. My son asked my mom when he was like three, I was trying to explain to him about me being adopted because my cousin, Brad being friends with us. And he asked my mom, who's my mom's real mom. And you know, that is painful for adopted parents, of course, but it wasn't like we went on and had a conversation about it. I was in trouble all day. It's like, what? I was, really? Yeah, not really. No one got mad at me, but all day there was kind of this like mm, tension, tension. I've done. How did she wrong. answer him? My mom was great with kids and people. She was so loving. She was like, well, I'm your mom's mom, but she had another mom who had her and gave him the full and he was listening, you know, he's little. And she explained it so well, but all day there was a big tension. Like I had done some bad parenting by even bringing this up. 
you know, and you feel guilty. I feel guilty even talking about it. It's a strange. It is. I, I remember, you know, and I'm sure my dad was like overwhelmed with his own life, but asking questions and him being more like, Sarah, I don't know. Yeah. You know, that, that irritated, irritated <laughs> it, which maybe was just disinterest or I don't know, male dealing with all those things back in the, that era or, or just not even wondering himself. Well, he has told me, you know, he was very, very overwhelmed in those years. And, you know, that at one point realizing I was too old for him to have to give a bath. And, you know, so I think he just didn't, I think he was just sleepwalking through having these four young children on his own. And uh, And the reality is the the message you got as a kid, because they are going through their thing, the message you got was, I don't know, you know, that's, I you shouldn't even ask. Whole, like, like, why do you care? It was kind of more like you're here I now. Sort of got well, my the dad is care. My dad very much is a person, uh, and maybe because the mistakes of the past are too painful to face. But he is very. He will not engage in conversations about our past. He's just like it's over. Move on. Things are good now. You know. Yeah. There is no room to discuss anything from the past. So. I think it could have been part of that, you know, yeah. just move on, look move forward. On. Don't look yeah. back. There's yeah. no point in looking back. Yeah. It's been tough. Up. But- <laughs> we, um, when I, when, you know, my story. So when I did tell my dad, um, you know, that my biological family found me, he was really big on the, mm-hmm. they weren't supposed to, those records were supposed to be sealed. And she talked about that, how that was the promise that those records would be sealed Yeah, for life. They said they would for, for life. life. Yeah. And in Colorado, I think they're still arguing that for life. But the thing is, is that's not what happens to people. People want to know who they are. And that's the, she talks about, you want for someone, like you said, the lost self part, you don't, until you know, kind of where you're from or who you are, you don't have a true sense of self. Mm-hmm. So that's why adopted people are so good at being chameleons and being the good girl. She was the good girl. I, she said, I'm, I, I was the good girl. You want to make sure you're looking pretty good in that family, you know, cause what if they leave too? You know, it's a whole, I wasn't the good girl, but, <laughs> <laughs> but you were, when you were little, I, I mean, think... again, you know, yes. it's hard to <laughs> distinguish all the, we trauma. would have hung out by the way <laughs> <laughs> here, but she does say this cumulative adoption trauma begins when they are separated from the mother at birth builds when they learn that they were not born to the people they call mother and father and is further compounded when they are denied knowledge of the mother and father to whom they were born. Mm. Yes. Further compounded. I mean, because then you're in the, and the Shasta says she's not going to speak to adoption games in here. She's speaking to ghosts. Did mm-hmm. you find that interesting? Yes. That all the ghosts that, that the all the ghosts carries it's a ghost story for it tells the that ghosts that haunt the dark crevices of the unconscious and trail each member of the adoption triangle, parents and child alike, wherever they Mm go. One thing, one thing we skipped over that I, she, the, I don't know that our last book addressed this as much. She did address that the adoptive parents, why the child is going through grieving of losing their biological mother as a baby, the adopted parents are going through grief that maybe that's not their biological child. Mm -hmm. And I haven't really, I don't think we've heard that because I was thinking just personally about that. Like my mom lost a baby and was she looking at me as like, of course she loved me, but am I really her baby? See what I'm saying? Like, yeah, she really addresses that all three. And of course the birth mother is in pain, of course, probably more than, you know, not more than anybody, but as much as the adopted child. So I think I was like, oh, all three have grief. I don't know that I've thought of that like that in the, in that way. I, yeah. I don't know that I, I have either. Um, <clears throat> yeah. The ghost stuff. And, I'm trying and to she, the one other thing she said is her, her um, birth mother and all birth mothers, they go away with the scarlet S right of shame. And they're, it's the most traumatic part of their lives that they're never supposed to discuss with anybody. Mm-hmm. And that's like, the they, just think of it. It's just, this is an unhealthy thing. Completely. <laughs> all. <laughs> I never really looked at Secrets. it. Like all this. You know, you can't talk about anything, hold your pain in 
we are, we're supposed to be happy. We're, yes. we're supposed to be lucky and grateful. And yeah, I can't really wait to dig in. It's, I just, know, me it's too. such I'm a excited. rich book. And the next chapter that we'll move on to is called The Mothered Motherless Self. So I love it. I, I'm excited to dig in and try to follow along with us in this one now that. Yeah. Yeah. Be, and reach fun. out to us on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. And just uh, also, we have a TikTok. We're, we're going to. Oh, we have a pay, TikTok. Pay more attention. <laughs> <laughs> we're getting into TikTok. Please go to at the Making of Me podcast on TikTok. We have yeah. one, one, one video, <laughs> but we will have more. <laughs> we're kind of learning how do we, you know, make it look cool to have a TikTok. So. Anyway, we're excited about our guest. Yes. Yes. I think we think you're going to like him. We like him a lot. A lot. All right. See you soon. See you soon.